Hi, Michelle. Hi, Emily. Hello. Hi, Belinda. <laughs> How are you two doing today? <sighs> it's a beautiful spring. We're just having such a lovely, lovely weather. It makes my heart feel light. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, that's very nice right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, I'm really delighted for this series to be kicked off because yeah. it's important. We're sharing important information. Mm -hmm. So before we start, I'm just going to introduce you guys really quickly. Um, we're here with, or I'm here with Michelle Linden and Emily Palmer. Michelle, the glasses, Emily Blonde. <laughs> a Wild Mother Collective. Wild Mother Collective is an online and in-person village in Portland, Oregon, to support mothers through all stages of parenting, from birth to emptiness and beyond. They are mothers that have been down, around, into, and through the motherhood journey. Their skills as educators, facilitators, and mentors have been crafted for more than two decades, and they have plenty to share from their education to lived experiences. But even more so, they know the greatest and most powerful gifts and resources are the ones every mother is already holding. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So I've invited Michelle and Emily for a series of interviews to break down the picture of a child at each age from birth to teens. Basically, mainstream medical has a view of developmental milestones that I'm not sure what it's based on, but it's quite standardized and linear and doesn't really honor each unique child. And it also doesn't really give a picture of a of what a child needs, the essentials of what a baby needs to develop healthily. And that's why I've, I've invited the Wild Mother Collective to come on and give us a picture of that. What I feel that Michelle and Emily can offer based on their decades of experience as mothers and educators, and more specifically Steiner's philosophy on child development is a more holistic and um, spiritual perspective of childhood development and what we could be doing for our children to support their development physically, mentally, and spiritually. We're going to break down these segments in, into age segments for interview, uh, little kind of brackets. And today we are kicking off with birth to 1.5 years. Such a short bracket, but I'm sure you have a lot to share there's so now. much that happens in this age bracket. Oh my gosh, please share everything. <laughs> well, whew, it's like where to start. I suppose the beginning is a great place to start. Um, a baby is born and doesn't quite land in your arms, but sometimes it feels like that. It's like, poof, there's a baby. And now what do I do? You know, it's it was quite the journey to get there. And that's a whole nother topic. But, um, but you know, so often we're, we begin and, and we have this baby and we've thought so much about, about how the baby's going to come. But then what do we do when baby gets there? Mm -hmm. And what does baby need? And what does mom need in order to tend for baby? Because really, those first few months, especially, especially, the mom and the baby are not separate. So what baby needs for its well-being is a, a mother that feels supported and, and cared for. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Baby and mother are connected. Yeah, they're, they're connected. And, and just to, to say that in a different way than what Michelle was beautifully pointing to is like what baby needs is also what mama needs. <laughs> like they, they need the same things and, and taking care of the mama 
helps take care of the baby um, because that baby is pulling and using her life forces to create its own. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, if possible, gosh, when you guys talk like that, I'm imagining, visualizing in my mind, this sort of cocoon, like once you give birth to have sort of like a dark space where you and your baby can just be taken care of in this little cocoon and food would just be brought to you and you just kind of have like quiet. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is exactly, that is exactly it. Because if we can if we can make sure, well, like how, how much do we go into this? Um, okay, really quickly. <laughs> the, the, the pregnancy piece of, of what's happening there is, is an expansion and brings a tremendous amount of heat and warmth to the body, right? It's this very um, dynamic time of the body. So it's bringing a lot of heat energetically, actually physically, and it's expansive. And as soon as the baby is born, the body's hormones drop into a postmenopausal level and the body becomes very cool. Like everything cools down rapidly. So the goal is to physically, emotionally, spiritually, environmentally, keep that space warm to keep the mother healthy. And in doing that, she isn't depleted. She doesn't become, um, yeah, she doesn't become depleted, which means she can tend to all of baby's needs. Because as Emily said, the baby is surviving off of the mother physically, right. emotionally, mentally, spiritually, all of those ways. So if we can create that cocoon around the mother where she is just being fed and nourished and replenished after this extremely massive experience of birth, can we just <laughs> that then she has the resources to be able to support this new life. So that is like the foundation. Yeah. And I, I want to mention, I feel like that kind of, um, that sort of knowledge isn't really shared when you have a medical birth, you know, we're, we're, I'm Chinese. And so in the Chinese tradition, when um, a mother gives birth, the mother, like my mother would come and stay or some mother, my husband's mother or whatever, would come and stay with the mother and child for a month to cook for them. And they have specific, you know, traditional Chinese medicinal foods that they cook for you, the broths and everything to make sure that you are um, your, that your blood is healing well, that your body's healing well, and that you're be, being able to produce enough milk for your child, you know? And that's like really cared for and necessary. And like, you just don't get that when, if you're not Chinese, first of all, and you don't know that. And also if you have a medical birth, they, they don't really mm -hmm. treasure the birthing process at all. No. No. And these, the, so I know that it exists. I mostly know of the traditions of the Chinese culture, but through my studies that these, that tradition of caring for the mother after birth, anywhere from, depending on the culture, like three weeks to six weeks is these traditional practices that were around the world, postpartum care around the world, Russia, South America, you know, different Asian cultures. We know this is like forgotten information and we just need to bring it back up and remember, you know, yeah, you could borrow the lineage of someone else, but also like see what your, your lineage was of the original postpartum care but they're all the same. They all are rooted in the same thing, warmth, 
easily digestible foods, warmth for the mother, warmth in the environment, support of your community, like just keeping mom's stress level at zero as, or as little as possible. (laughs) 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 Stress, we just had a baby. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah. So Mm -hmm. that, that is the foundation and it is something that we need to raise Mm -hmm. our awareness of. And because, because how the mom feels is going to directly affect the child. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean and that can put a, that statement can put a lot of pressure on a mother because it doesn't mean that mom has to be perfect and it doesn't mean that she has to be happy all the time. It just means that she has to have those places that she can find some regulation, you know, that she can find some um, um, ease, you know, at different points. That I mean, you know, after a baby, you're all over the map. But yeah. if you are supported and you have your community and you have, you know, your environment feels warm and, and nurturing, then you can you can find those moments of ease and joy and rest more easily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And knowledge that forgiveness is really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Right. And- If you don't have that community, because we don't always have that, and we don't always have the support that we wish we had, then, then really honoring and valuing your own needs and well-being as a mother of prioritizing those basic things of sleep, of food, of just simplifying all of the demands on you and really allowing yourself this space to step into this new role and what it's going to call from you yeah yeah Thank yeah you. And it's a good place to start too mm-hmm. yeah. because the minute you have a baby you really have to advocate for yourself and the child for the rest of their lives yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and and thank you because th- what we are talking about it, the that piece is really it's the the ideal thing for a mother and yet our culture doesn't support that kind of care really let alone the fact that we don't even know that that is helpful um (laughs) but once we do know that it's helpful it's like well how am I supposed to do that you know and as Emily was pointing out some of that so much of that can just be done through some contemplation and planning prior to baby being born. Even if you don't have family around, as Emily said, like, well, what, what do I want? How, what can I prioritize? Where can I simplify? Um, and if we can think about those things before baby comes, then in the midst of this massive transition into motherhood, that you have some ideas. You're not just winging it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point mm-hmm. that we, I don't think that we're familiar with really, right? Yeah. Contemplation, yeah. meditation before you have the baby. Mm-hmm. you yeah. know because the the common term is like what's your birth plan exactly which really everybody throws their birth plan out the window when she gets to the hospital anyways because <laughs> yeah if it's not coming out you're going to get a c-section period yeah. <laughs> right but like beyond the birth plan yeah right? yeah what's your life plan with baby yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do you want to feel <laughs> yeah when you step into that parenthood role yeah, yeah. But just to bring it back to, to this time of life with infancy, um, to one and a half years, like that, that beautiful symbiotic relationship of mother and child, especially when they're extremely little, like, even if you didn't think about it ahead of time, like it forces you 
into it of like really getting, I mean, you're just going to want to sleep when your baby's sleeping, eat when they're eating. Like you just, you just develop and, and tune into those rhythms. And I just always encourage mamas to like, just let go of any thought about like providing anything for anyone else for a little while until you get your feet under you. But yeah, sleep, sleep, sleep. Yeah. Don't yeah. worry about laundry. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like all of those, those things we can just let go of for a while and give ourselves permission for that part of our lives to fall apart a little bit. Um, because our focus right now is on this new, new life. And, and, you know, Michelle was talking about that warmth of that gestation. Well, when a baby is born, it's like the second gestation of mother and child. It's the second womb that happens um, really through that first one and a half years. Um, it's, it's a second womb period. So you're still, you want to cultivate warmth in so many different ways. Um, you want physical body warmth, you want soul warmth and emotional depth and connection. You want an environment that feels warm and cozy and is protecting their developing senses. Because just imagine how, like, just try, try to imagine being this new life that just came into this world that was all tucked and cozy in this warm soft, wet, like space and muffled sounds, like everything was soft and gentle and muted and then pushed into this world where everything's bright and cold and noisy. <laughs> everything's new. And so you have to remember like this little infant is in the state of immediate overwhelm. <laughs> And what our role right now as parents is to really buffer and create this, this mantle of protection and warmth around them so that they can just start to peek out and explore. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what is the baby experiencing? You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they they know that that the way that a baby hears is some something like i don't know it's like 25 times the the um the volume of sound that human that an adult hears because as adults we've developed all kinds of ways to be able to filter all of the sounds that we hear because there's multiple sounds happening all at one time and babies haven't developed any of those filters yet. So just sound alone is so much more intense for, for them volume wise and the different layers and levels of sound. Um, and it's, and it's this way with all of the senses, the, the senses are just very heightened interesting yeah. yeah so we build up filters as we grow so as like mm -hmm. a newbie out it's fresh yeah. and everything is like yeah. expanded yeah yeah triple yeah there and you know we yeah that part of learning how to filter is learning how to focus and we can let in certain things at certain times that's a skill you develop as you age and develop but as an infant, you don't have that skill. That's that's for you to learn. So you're hearing all of the sounds at once. <laughs> all, you're taking in all of the sensations at once without that ability to focus on one of them. So, so infants get easily overwhelmed and that's why they sleep so much. <laughs> it's yeah. It's too much. It's too much. And they're preparing all of their energy is really preparing. They're still developing all of their organs. Nice. You know, that's the thing. Like they don't come out with like perfect little livers and everything. <laughs> like they're not like, and then they just get bigger, but like, they're actually developing all of those internal systems still, like even just to have regular breath. 
Yeah. Like those, all of their rhythmic system, all of their bodily functions are developing. So all of their energy is really focused in this physical development. Um, and they're taking in so many new things. Yeah. So they, yeah, they just, they sleep and that's their work. Sleep, <laughs> digest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we need, babies are born premature. Even mm -hmm. if they're born at full term, they're basically born premature. And so we need to think of that. What Emily was saying is that those first three months, that's why they call it the fourth trimester is because baby is still developing. It's basically like we're kangaroos and we just mm -hmm. need to keep baby in the pouch so it can continue um, to develop mm -hmm. all of the things. I mean, it, will continue but like that really is a continued gestational period those first three months mm -hmm. so mama's nutrition is really important mm -hmm. the baby's Rest. environment and the and the baby is is still attached to the mom etheric mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and then so what does what does you know what happens when if the baby is still etherically attached to the mom. And then let's say like three months down the road, the baby's three months old and you pass the baby on to somebody else. Does it then sort of also pull etherically from that person? If, if I am understanding your question correctly, that an, an infant, an an infant will like energetically, you mean? Yeah, will, will whatever, I mean, the mother and the infant and the partner, that is sort of the, the triad, the main uh -huh. triad. But if there is another caregiver, then the, then the um, infant, the, the baby, the child um, does receive life force from, from the caregiver no matter who it is, just because that part of the child hasn't been developed yet. We call it, or some people call it, you know, your etheric forces. Right. Yeah, your etheric body is developing and, and a baby and an infant doesn't have their etheric forces developed yet. So they use that of the caregiver or the adult that is around them in order to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So what are the best conditions, you know, for birth to 1.5? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ideal. Yeah. Well, some of them we've touched on. So, you know, warmth in the environment, actual temperature, keeping. Oh, did my. You're fine. I <laughs> we could still see you. <laughs> oh, okay. Was that like this? <laughs> no, you were just fine. you were you were frozen. frozen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. So sorry. The question again was sorry. Sorry. What do what they need? Ideal. Oh yeah. So the main things that they need they need they need sleep. They need proper nutrition. They need movement. Um. You know, so, well, the first three months is really just about cocooning. And then after that, they're naturally going to start to come out of their environment, right? They're, you'll see more interaction with the baby. They'll be looking around a little bit more. They'll overcome their primitive reflexes. So, you know, they're going to start to like reach out from their, from their body and like grab things and do things that a little bit more intentionally. And so giving the baby space without always interacting, just time alone to, to exist and to be and watch the shadows on the wall and just adjust to their environment and, and hear the sounds of the world. You know, we don't need to entertain our babies. They don't need that. There's so much that is happening for them just in their existence, you know? Um, they, yeah, they need touch and connection. Um, and 
and communication, you know, but not in the way of like talking too much, just in um, uh, like the work of, of Rye Resources for Infant Education, you know, they're wonderful. And they talk about that need for secure attachment and communication in those early those early years of, and I always think of the, the changing the diaper example, mm -hmm. you know, of talking your child with just simple words of what is going to happen next so that they feel secure in it. Because changing a diaper is a very vulnerable thing, you know, even though that child doesn't have story around it. It's like, you know, these are that area of the body is warm <laughs> and then all of a sudden the diaper comes off and it's cold and somebody's touching you and cleaning you and like then moving your body around and you don't have any say in that and so to just do a, a simple little narrative you know around that or before you go pick up your child who has no say in that you can just do simple again simple broadcasting of like I'm going to pick you up and then you pick them up so that they feel in their body that there's a, a trust in the world, yeah. you know, that there's a, a relationship and a respect and, and it can soothe the nervous system. So that's what I mean by communication, mm -hmm. but I don't mean that we talk to our children all the time because that in itself is really overwhelming, overstimulating, <laughs> overstimulating. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I like that. I like the talking to them as far as, you know, letting them know you're going to pick them up because then you'd think that they would probably build a little bit of muscle memory or like memory where like when they hear you say that, then they're expecting it. And then it's not so jarring all the time because think of how many times you pick them up in a day. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And again, these are perfect scenario situations. Like that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes right. you're just going to be rushing and like, or, or your child is about to, you know, put their hand in something dangerous. And, but, you know, these are things we strive for. These aren't things that we have to put pressure on ourselves to do. But if we know the information, then we can utilize it when we remember. <laughs> Yeah. And, it, and it's not always based on words because we do a lot of nonverbal communication and that's actually really important when they're young because words actually don't make any sense to them until they have a context for them. <laughs> so you're right. building context when you're, when you're broadcasting and things like that. But more so it's just when they hear your voice and your tone they start to have a deeper um, connection and understanding. So even if you're not saying I'm going to pick you up, but but you're greeting them like, hey, sweetie, and then you're, you're holding them like that's the same type of connection. And um, so it's really it's as as an adult and parent, you're you're building this awareness of intent in what I'm doing. How how can I be intentional and connective? in what I am doing, changing a diaper. So it's not mechanical. It's not just rough because really what we're, we're trying to create that sense of safety by not startling them and to just go in and touch someone is startling. We know that as adults, um, so same as that. Yeah. You know, without any, any, like, here it comes or any, you know, any cues, it's, it's yeah. frightening. We'll scream, <laughs> you know? So just thinking of those little things with, with babies of just like, oh yeah. So I'm just gonna like, maybe say their name or I'll start singing a song. And here I am looking at them as I go in to take them kind of thing. So you're just really bringing, again, warmth the warmth through connection, emotional, intentional connection. I have a, a girlfriend of mine who is a Waldorf preschool teacher and she recently adopted a baby and I went to go visit them and her, her partner mm -hmm. is hilarious because he makes fun of her because she literally sings all transitions. And so he's like, all right, Linda, we're, you know, we're going to go take the baby in. She's done eating, so, but we don't talk to her. We sing to her. So everything needs to be sung. And it's hilarious because he's singing too. It's adorable. Aww. But, you know, like this child is so well cared for because she's thought of everything and she really brings the warmth in all aspects. 
mm-hmm. you know, and you can just see this child, literally her face is, is lit up all the time. She's, mm-hmm. she's joy. She's just joy embodied. Yeah. It yeah. makes such a huge difference. Yeah. And, and warmth in itself is not necessarily a familiar concept to a lot of people. Like when we talk about warmth we've talked about it here you know there is the physical body temperature of like keeping the baby warm keeping a hat on the infant's head so that it keeps the the warmth into the body because so much heat escapes off of the head and keeping socks on because so much heat escapes from the body but but there is when we think of of warmth for those that like this concept is new like if you imagine that that feeling of when you walk into someone's home and like, you know, maybe in the fall and there's the smell of cinnamon and candles are lit and there's cozy blankets on the, on the couch. And you're, you walk in and you just feel that like cozy (laughs) settling in. I feel something feels really yummy and good in my body. I feel safe and and like, I could just stay here. That's the feeling of warmth that we're cultivating yeah. mm-hmm. in relationship. Yeah. And there's people that you meet that are like that too. Yeah. Like right? just in their speech, yeah. the way that they carry themselves, they've got this warmth about them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to go back to real quickly, you had um, touched upon primitive reflexes. Isn't it that primitive reflexes, the child, you want the child eventually as we move into like the, um, the later years to move away from the primitive reflexes because there are some things that they could do that keeps them um, continuing to do the primitive reflexes and we want them to shed that. Yeah, yes, yes. We want, we want the primitive reflexes to go from the the primitive reflexes are sort of an involuntary movement that is, is, you know, built into our central nervous system for survival. And as uh, the human being develops, those primitive reflexes become integrated into the body and they move past them to become voluntary, more like voluntary movements. Um, So, you know, like the rooting reflex, the baby's not thinking about it when it turns its head and starts to, ah, like this when it wants to nurse, right? (laughs) That's just, it will do that to anything, right? That's Mm -hmm. a rooting primitive reflex. It will do that to your nose. It'll do that to your elbow, like anything. Mm -hmm. But as the baby develops, it becomes voluntary. They become aware of, I'm hungry. This is my mouth. That is the breast, like now I'm going to eat. So, and it's like that with all of the reflexes and, and to be able to do that part, part of that is, um, for the, the child to have that sort of time, time alone, to be able to move, to be able to discover, to be able to look at their hands, to be able to explore, uh, you know, just, um, growing into their, into their body. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things sure you probably have some more on that Emily well I just movement free free movement yeah free movement free natural movement yeah you know so not setting the babies up in things that they're not ready for like like you know the walkers were a thing for a while the bouncy seats if the child can't actually put their body up on their feet they shouldn't be in a position where they're using their feet like that Um, so really just, you know, until they're able to get up on their own, they're just on a blanket laying there. (laughs) They're just on their belly. Like eventually they'll roll over on their belly. They'll start to wiggle. They start to figure out the way to get themselves somewhere. And that's what we want because that is actually how they work through those primitive reflexes. Mm -hmm. Um, and they start to integrate and that is actually, is essential to their brain development as well and crossing those synapses and both hemispheres of the brain so crawling we want our children to crawl as much as possible Um, that's a reflex that often gets delayed um, quite a bit and as a teacher in kindergarten I'm still working with children helping them crawl Um, 
So they're, they're, we want them to just move their bodies the way that their bodies feel called to move. When, um, when, you, when you say that um, the crawling is delayed, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Are you saying that they're, they naturally skip crawling or is it because they've been put into unnatural things that um, causes them to skip the crawling? It can be different. It can be different things, um, but sometimes you'll see it where they haven't actually learned to crawl, and they'll do it like with a one-legged crawl or like because things like this front, right? Yeah, front. and so and what we're always looking for is ultimately to get to this counter movement. Um, you know, that's, that's really important to their, to their development. So we want to see that. And so we want to encourage that too. Um, not, not that that's something people have to worry about and stress about my baby's not crawling, but just giving them that opportunity to really explore and move their body the way that they are feeling called to. That's really essential. So it's just, it's, you know, um, I'm hearing you guys say that, okay, so giving your baby um free time just yeah. put them on a blanket yeah and then even if they start to crawl or sit up then do we just put that like sort of like a playpen around them and just if we're not able to watch them obviously mm -hmm. we'll watch them if you can but if you you're not then you could maybe put like a playpen around them so they can still crawl around and still discover mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of free time yeah. And then that's, you know, Rye was always good about this too, of just like, you know, then you, you place the little attractive things just slightly out of reach, <laughs> <laughs> you know, where they start to have to stretch and move, you know, uh -huh. and, you know, it's, yeah, this is like this, all of the movement that happens in a, in an infant's body to get them upright on their feet is, is, it's kind of mind blowing all the things they have to go through to finally have the will and the physical strength to stand up. <laughs> it's amazing. We don't, and we don't need to rush it. We don't need to rush it because there is something about that internal drive that is so essential to their well being as well. Right. That's the first part of, you know, exercising their will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. If we help them to stand up, then they're not exercising their will. They haven't really like, I want to get that. And so I'm going to. I'm determined and I will figure it out myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah. which is part of ultimately down the road is part of confidence. Yeah. Right. It's what develops confidence. It's this mastery of like, I, I, yeah, the drive, the desire, the push, the will to achieve something and the sense of accomplishment that you have once you've just, you know, once you've done that one thing. And sometimes parents out of their best intentions want to help the child to reach the, the goal. Right. And so because the, the child can get frustrated, you know, and irritated and they might even cry and we think, oh, well, if I help them, you know, that that I'm creating less trauma for them because now they're not upset. But that that upset is all part of the process of like part of part of the drive and then part of the success. Right. That mm -hmm. feels so good in the end. And that develops confidence over the years. It's very yeah. tough. You feel yeah. masterful in your masterful. body. That's yeah. body autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, in, um, it's imperative. So, so if you have something, if you play something out of reach and the child is crying and they're so upset, you just sort of acknowledge, oh yeah, it is kind of far. Mm -hmm. Or you don't say anything at all. And then you just leave the thing there. Yeah. And they'll get to it when they get to it. They'll get to it when they get to it. And, you know, if they've been crying for a while, maybe it's time to pick them up and comfort them. Like, oh, you really wanted that thing. Uh -huh. You know, if you think you know what it's about, like you were really trying. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you can just like verbally, you know, verify and acknowledge what it is like, oh, that's so far away from you. Mm -hmm. That's hard. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But not bring it to them. Not necessarily, but I think that's like, there's no hard and fast rule with that either. Yeah. Like never give your child right. what they want. <laughs> But that sounds pretty brutal. I mean, like you have to like, just, you know, what's happening, just acknowledge it, notice like what time it is. And like, yeah, so maybe they got really, really frustrated and then you pick them up and you're acknowledging it and then you get the thing and then let them explore it in your lap for a while. Like, yeah, it's not like we're just like, oh, boot camp. Yeah. <laughs> Baby boot camp. <laughs> it's just tips. It's not. Part yeah. Of I mean, remember because we're, this everyone is intuitive. Yeah. <laughs> every yeah. mother, every parent knows what's best. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Feel into the moment. Feel. Feel. Tune into your child. Like, do you know? Do they need? Do they, does it feel best to actually give that to them? You know, after you pick them up and you sue them for a little while, does it feel better to be like, oh, we'll just get that next time and you move on to something else or, I, yeah. Or maybe you just give it to them. I don't know. Like <laughs> each time, you know, just feel what, what, what is their capacity? You know, what is your, how do you feel that day? What is your capacity to be able to handle the yeah. situation at the time? You know, because if you're it, like Emily said, if you're just in baby boot camp, but you know, you're fried because you've worked all day, well, that's not going to go well for anybody. Like, you know, then you've got a crying infant and a dysregulated and, mother. Yeah, and a dysregulated mother just wants to leave. <laughs> I just want to leave. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I'm liking all of these little points, just kind of mm -hmm. looking at, you know, from birth to 1.5. It seems very simple. Yeah, mm -hmm. very, very simple. And, and again, just to reiterate mm -hmm. that, you know, the warmth and the rest, you know, rest is so important for both mom and baby oh and the other thing I wanted to touch on um I don't remember you were talking about something and I was thinking about how we will so often compare our babies to other yeah. people's babies and we're like and we think oh well my child isn't crawling yet or my child isn't walking yet or they're not talking yet and and to remember that these milestones that were given you know, by doctors were like, they took, you know, like 500 babies or something. And then they, at, then they created an average and that became, that average became what is the norm. But to create that norm, there was 50% on either side. So the range is quite wide of each child's different ability and timeline to get to where they're going to go. So trying to not compare and, and trust in our own child's process that they are doing exactly what they need in, on their timeline that is good for their body and their temperament and their way of being in the world. Yeah. yeah. And there, you know, those, there can be amazing developmental jumps too, where like, we we might be worried that they're not they're not standing and then it can happen overnight and and they're standing and they're walking like it like you never know what that child's path is some children are are these amazing observers and they will just watch until something in them knows that i can do this completely perfectly now and they'll just do it <laughs> there's no practice they just do it <laughs> You know, so so they're coming in with their you your their unique skills, their unique ways of of observing the world and and taking their place in it. Um, so let them let them do that and don't worry too much about it. Um, and also, you know, as they get older in that time period, 
um, with sitting and crawling and standing and walking, you know, if they're around other babies that are on different areas of those pathways, it, because all children learn through imitation, if they see another child doing it, they will more quickly learn it. <laughs> Yeah, I had the, I remember when I was doing my teacher training so very long ago, and the teacher I had for child development was giving this example of her baby. She's like, oh yeah, she, she just was not getting how to sit up. She just couldn't do it. And I just had a friend whose daughter was sitting up. So, so I just let them be next to each other. And then she sat up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, they, they learn from each other. Like, oh, that baby can do it. I'll do it too. Um, yeah, it's, it's so fascinating, but yeah, there's never a reason to, to really worry too much. And yeah, comparing naturally brings fear and worry. And it's not generally a good habit to have for comparing our children and comparing ourselves as parents. Not good. Yeah. What was I going to say about that? Um, oh yeah. And, you know, they say our children pick us. Mm -hmm. right? And so it's like, as a parent who's bringing this child into this, this world, there is something to be said about having curiosity and reverence for the soul. Mm -hmm. right? So instead of being curious, being okay with where he or she is at and knowing that whatever he or she is experiencing it's also probably something that we need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's that concept of, you know, as a, as a mother, you know, with all of the struggles and challenges that, you know, I went through that most mothers go through, it was so um, helpful <laughs> for me to have that idea that my children pick me and that all of my imperfections and all of the things and the ways that I parented them was exactly what they needed in this life for their own growth. And now that my children are, my daughter just turned 29 and my son is close to 25 years old. And I can see now, I can see where the, the challenges that I brought to them as a parent, like the things that I didn't do so great um, and the things that I did really well, how it, it served them, how it brought them to develop certain aspects of themselves that um, have allowed them to really thrive in the world and to become the adults that they are so thank you for bringing that up yeah. because I think it's if we can hold that from the beginning I think it's really helpful along our journey as parents yeah, yeah. it's that um we never know we never know where the gift is yeah yeah and and how we receive the gifts of transformation through the process as well. You know, it's a co-creative process. And, you know, the way that we are changed by our children and the needs they present is also amazing. And to, to really honor and acknowledge that too, like if you choose to be a parent, you're choosing a path of transformation. It's just going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So much that they're teaching us every mm -hmm. single time we interact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, girls, did we cover? Oh, there goes my light. Did we cover um, birth through one point five? I think. I think so. Is there anything else that? There's nothing extremely poignant that's coming to my mind right now no me either yeah warmth mm -hmm. yeah warmth, warmth in all action. yeah sleep nutrition time alone movement you had thought of maybe talking about um first foods 
and things like that. Oh, that's true. Um, we could talk a little bit about first foods. Yeah, I think that's important. Okay. Yeah, and then the other thing I was going to talk about is um, to uh, to take your to take the um, <laughs> the lactation consultant's um, advice. With, you know, just not just give it a little bit of time. So I don't know. We could talk about that too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I, I do a lot of work with postpartum moms. <clears throat> and one thing that I have noticed and been hearing over the years is some that like lactation consultants with all of their wonderful knowledge and helpful, um, cues are can sometimes jump a little too much into a, a a state of worry and concern of an an intervention very quickly and i've been noticing that if you can maybe not jump to the interventions right away um give it a little bit of time that baby will often find its way to the breast. There's a beautiful tradition called the breast crawl. And it's, have you heard of it? No. Okay. And you put your newborn, and this can be done anytime, you know, it's ideally done at the beginning, like right, you know, within the first few hours of birth, but it can be done anytime within like the first month where you put the baby on, on your tummy and the baby will literally push. It can take sometimes up to an hour, an hour and a half, and the baby will literally push itself up and latch on to the breast all on its own. You can Google these videos. I cry every single time, every I single time. I wish I had known that. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. And it's part of that. It, it's kind of like helping, um, you know, it's along the lines of the primitive reflexes, you know, that it, it becomes this automatic thing and it allows, um, it allows a certain knowingness to occur for the child, this infant, this newborn to be able to latch and find the breast on its own. Um, and so, well, there's that piece of it. And then you know, a lot of babies are being, um, told that they have, or a lot of mothers are being told that their babies have tongue ties yep. and that they're, um, yeah, that they're very common right now. And yes, that can be true. And even the La Leche League has said at certain times, um, like just give it a few days, you know, sometimes it can just be part of the development of the mouth. So to not rush right away into intervention, because in the same way that we begin to intervene during the birth process, if we intervene too much, then it takes us down a road of difficulty and challenge. And this can be true with nursing and breastfeeding as well. So and again, I want to say, do what you need and do what feels good. And if it resonates with you and you're feeling like, yes, this is true, what this lactation consultant is saying, then absolutely do do it. Do what you feel is right in that moment. But I just want to plant the seed that just because it's a lactation consultant doesn't mean that they have more authority over your own intuition of what your child may need. So oh, yeah. just to take that into consideration that they, that just because they're a lactation consultant doesn't mean that they have the ultimate authority and knowledge. So just even totally, if they talk that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So just to, to hold those, those two things and ultimately do what you feel is, is best, but mm -hmm. to know that. And then baby's first foods. Oh, one of the 
best. So, you know, we had this thing for decades. I was a baby. It's like my first food was dehydrated rice cereal. And <laughs> that's what was an ideal baby's first food. Um, but according to, you know, nourishing traditions and, um, and Sally Fallon and, and all of the people along, along that line of thinking as far as nutrient dense brain developing organ supporting foods for baby, um, egg yolk, soft egg yolk is one of the best first foods for baby egg whites hold the allergens, the yolks. It's very, very rare that somebody is allergic to the yolks of an egg and you don't want it dry because that would create a choking hazard. So it can't be dry, but just a soft, just the innards of a soft boiled egg is a fabulous first food. You know that you are going against the medical establishment when you say that you know. and all the media. <laughs> No oh, to eggs, no to eggs until they're one. Yeah. Right? No to eggs and honey until they're one. Yeah. That is yeah. so good to know because the egg is really complete nutrition, the whole thing, once you're old enough to have it. Yeah. So that is good to know. Soft yeah. world. But you would never give it to them raw. You wouldn't give it, no, you wouldn't give it to them raw. But I mean, you know, that's like, that's also relative like some people if it's a soft boiled egg they're like well that's a raw egg my husband won't eat those at all <laughs> like <"Ooh." laughs> it has to be cooked till I think it's gross for him to eat it yeah. <laughs> I think that's a lovely idea I think the rice thing is terrible I mean, oh. yeah I did the same thing I mean they always tell you to start with rice why yeah rice. it's got like no nutritional value at all no nutritional value. And there's a really fabulous, I mean, we're just touching on that like really quickly, but you know, all of the, the fatty, the fatty foods are great first foods and, um, nourishing traditions actually has a, a baby book on, yeah. on foods and they've got all kinds of recipes in there, you know, egg yolks, liver, um, gosh, I, I think avocado, like just all kinds of really fabulous nutrient dense ideas for baby's first food. And they have it sectioned for, you know, different ages. And yeah, so we highly yeah. recommend that nourishing traditions, baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's nourishing traditions, baby care or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your time, ladies. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. And we'll talk about 1.5 to three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Those are the good times, man. Yes. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay. Sounds right. good. Bye. Bye.